Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you all for being here. My name is Russell Shorto. I'm the director of the John Adams Institute, which is an independent American culture center here in Amsterdam. Um, twice before the John Adams has, uh, has uh, had the Jonathan Safran Foer here, and uh, the first time was in 2002 for his breakthrough novel, Everything is Illuminated. And then in 2004, with his novel, Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. As I'm sure all of you know, this time he has detoured into nonfiction and gone down a path that's that was cleared by uh, Michael Pollan, whom incidentally we had at the John Adams here last year, and others, but he has done so with a novelist's eye for perspective and detail, and, and the result is something really quite, quite different and remarkable. The way our events work, uh, Jonathan will speak for a while and whatever, I hope it will be roughly on the topic of food, but uh, you never know. Um, and uh, then we will have a moderated discussion or conversation and then uh, it'll be open to questions. Uh, our moderator, Peter van der Wielen, is a Dutch radio and television journalist for VPRO Television. He hosted the science program Norderlicht and the program Dat kan Beter. On radio, he's one of the presenters for VPR Radio 1. And on Radio 5, he interviews scientists for the program Huzo. Peter van der Veen. Well, um, at this point, I get to introduce Jonathan Seven Four to you. Um, well, I don't know. I could say something about you, probably. But I think everyone already knows a lot about you. That's why they are here. So. Um, Please step up to the stage, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, the man who needs no introduction, Jonathan Safran Foer. Thank you. Everybody needs an introduction. Um, I was looking at that image. I guess it's hard not to, especially if it's you. And um, I simply don't recognize that shirt. I don't think... <laughs> All joking aside, I don't own that shirt. I've never worn that shirt. I can't. I have, I have few enough shirts that I would know if that was one of mine. And it's not. Um, thank you so much for coming. It's an incredible honor. I can think of no place. Let me give this a twist. I might need someone to help with this, actually. Um, or I can just hold it. I can think of no place that I would um, rather, rather read than Amsterdam. His last act as an employee of this building. <laughs> um, I, I am uh, extremely grateful to be here um, to the John Adams Institute and also to my publisher, Ambo Anthos, who has um, been my publisher since that first time that I came here in 2002, um, and who also introduced me to my wife, which I mention, I think, every time that I'm here, but deserves mentioning until, God forbid, something bad happens in the relationship. Um, so, when I go home, one of the first things that I'm going to have to do is buy a new computer because my laptop, I've had probably since that first visit, really, I've had it for a very long time. I'm always reluctant to buy new computers just for superstitious reasons. Um, but this one has been dropped a number of times and it's getting slower and slower and slower. And so, I told my four-year-old, who features prominently in this book, and that's why I'm bringing it up now, I told him that he could have my computer when I'm done with it. And he said, oh, that's great. And I said, we could even put a little desk you know, in your room, and that could be your desk where you do your work on what will be your computer. And he said, no, I think I will, um, I'll just share your desk and your office, and we'll put another chair, and we'll, we'll be next to each other. I said, that sounds great. What do you think you're going to do on, on my computer, which will then be your computer? And he said, well, I'll write, I'll write books just while you write books. And my little brother came by that night and this conversation extended itself. And my little brother was very fascinated with uh, the fact that my son was gonna be writing books. And he said to him, well, you're gonna be a writer, yeah? I heard my son said, yeah. He said, well, what kind of books are you gonna write? And my son looked at me and he said, tell him. And I said, I really don't know. I, what kind of books are you gonna write? He's like, tell him. And I said, I just don't know. And he came up to me and he said, Eating animals. 
So um, whether or not there's room enough in the world for two eating animals, I don't know. But this is, this is one in any case. And it was an unlikely book for me to write because I think of myself as a novelist. I will always be a novelist. It's very hard to imagine ever writing another work of nonfiction. But this book, this, the topic of this book has spoken to me since I was nine years old. Um, I was nine years old, and my older brother and I had a babysitter one night, and she wouldn't eat the chicken that he and I were eating. And I said, you know, you always eat with us. We have pizza, you eat pizza with us. We have pasta, you eat pasta with us. Why aren't you eating this chicken? And she said, well, you know, the chicken is chicken, don't you? I said, yes, of course. I'm not a total imbecile. And she said, do you know where chicken comes from? And she explained it to me in just a very matter-of-fact conversational way. She wasn't proselytizing. She wasn't arguing. I, I really don't think she was trying to persuade me of anything, but she did. Um, what she said in a nutshell was, um, I don't want to hurt anything. And it's when I now recount this story, it's very embarrassing. It sounds so sentimental, so overwrought, and so naive. And yet part of my embarrassment is, is for being embarrassed by that. Because, you know, who would? Who would want to? So I became a vegetarian when I was nine years old um, for about two or three weeks. That was it. And I started eating meat again for the reasons that everybody eats meat in the first place. It tastes good. It smells good. It's around. It's what other people eat. It's how we celebrate. It's we eat chicken soup when we have colds. You know, we have turkey, Americans do, on Thanksgiving and perhaps a barbecue on the 4th of July and so on and so forth. But the problem never resolved itself. And in fact, my parents' explanation when I brought this problem to them, hey, why is it that you don't let me kick the family dog, but we dismember and eat the flesh of these animals? Well, it's not quite that simple, these animals. And, you know, they told a parental story. And kids are very, very good at sniffing that kind of bullshit. I think much better than adults are, actually. And I knew it. I was willing to accept the story because... I was, at that point in my life, more interested in just having a stable world than I was in seeking truth. But I feel like I did pay a price for that, for that compromise, that willingness to accept something that wasn't quite right, that felt like a glossing over, or it wasn't, it wasn't sufficiently honest. And so I kept thinking about this, and I became a vegetarian many times. I probably became a vegetarian a dozen or two dozen times. Um, and which is to say I also became a carnivore a dozen or two dozen times. And it was this swinging pendulum, and I always had instincts that this is probably something I am uncomfortable with, or I would be uncomfortable with it if I were really to investigate it. On the other hand, I'm just not going to investigate it. You know, I'm going to be, I'm just not going to think about it. I will willfully push it out of my mind. And I was very successful at willfully pushing it out of my mind until this little writer who's going to write Eating Animals 2 um, entered, how can I say this, it's not pornographic, so that when my, when my wife can see, when, when he was, when he became part of, when he was going to be born, basically, um, and I started thinking about the prospect of having to make food choices on someone else's behalf, that was all of a sudden a very different kind of question, which took on a very different kind of urgency, and um, compelled serious thought in a way that my own food choices never did because I was content enough to have the swing pendulum for myself, but I didn't want it for my son. I didn't want to raise him like that. And I definitely didn't want to raise him in such a way that meals would regularly require willful ignorance. They would require him not to know where they came from. And I also didn't want to tell him stories that I didn't believe. Of course, you know, that, that is part of being a parent. Every single day, I think, of his four years of life, I have told him some version of a lie or some glossing over or something that isn't exactly right. But this one felt, first of all, very primary. You know, it's something we're engaging in three times a day, choosing what to eat. And also a situation where I don't have to lie. You know, talking to him about death or evil or all of these other things that these intractable problems in the world that we really have no choice but to either participate in or be the recipients of. That's hard. But food, you don't have to tell lies to yourself. You don't have to be willfully ignorant, especially not at this point in history, and especially not an audience like this one that does have access to other kinds of foods. You know, there's so many problems in the world now, so many very big problems. I wouldn't pretend that this is the biggest. Um, most of those problems 
require enormous sums of money to fix. Some of those problems require um, us to go to war, or so it seems. Um, some of them require us to um, take on a new set of values. And this is not like any of those. This does not require any of those things. It simply requires us to think about it, to stop and to pause. When we're at the supermarket, when we have the grocery cart, and we're shoveling stuff into it, when we're at a restaurant and we're looking at the various options on the menu, to stop and pause and say, is this really what I want or is this not what I want? So when I was trying to think about what to feed my son, I realized very quickly that it was not going to be a simple thought experiment, that it was going to require me to, first of all, go out into the world, and sometimes at very great difficulty and at great risk also, because there is the shroud of secrecy over animal agriculture globally now. Uh, if you wanted to go see the kind of farm that produces the meat that's in supermarkets, you would have no success with it. It would be impossible. In America, if you were to um, sort of take it into your own hands, you could actually um, be labeled a terrorist. There was a ter an Animal Terrorist Act passed after 2001, which makes trespassing onto a farm um, equivalent to an act of terrorism. Um, it also required me to go into myself and to investigate these instincts that I'd had since I was a kid. Were these actually based on anything, or are they just kind of sentimental vestiges of bedtime stories and stuffed animals and things that if I were to really think about them, if I were to really probe them, I would realize don't actually mean very much. And I didn't know. I feel like I wrote this book very genuinely open to different sides. And what I encountered was many different sides. And I think, I hope the book reflects that. The book is not really an argument. It's not a straightforward argument in any case. It's much more of a chorus of voices examining this issue. And the issue is not a philosophical one. It has nothing to do with whether it's right or wrong to eat animals. That is a question I'm actually not interested in. And I think it's the inappropriate question to ask. I think the real question is, is it right or wrong to do it the way that we're doing it? And to do it the ways that we will inevitably have to do it as the world population increases. So the book is quite unlike a novel, um, maybe most explicitly because the last 70 pages are footnotes. I was very much constrained to fact and to the world. And, and I really hated that a lot. I found it totally unfun. Um, but it was necessary for this kind of book because I never wanted anyone to doubt that when I said it's the worst in this respect that it was the worst, that when I say it's responsible for this, that I wasn't mincing words, that I wasn't speaking euphemistically, that I was um, telling it you know, as best as we know it. Despite all of that, despite the various kinds of investigative journalism that went into writing it, um, I don't think of it as a work of journalism. I really think of it as a story. And food ultimately has to be a story because for as much as reason tells us, it's not really reason that makes... We exercise our reasons, but reason isn't in the driver's seat when we're in the supermarket figuring out what to scoop into the cart or when we're in a restaurant looking at a menu. I think we, we enter a place that becomes irrational and that has to do with who our grandparents were, who our parents were or are, um, what we ate when we were kids, how we celebrated, what we were fed when we were sick, what kinds of books we were read when we were kids, how we think of ourselves, how we want to think of ourselves, um, if we're religious, how we practice our religions, if we're not religious, how our secular rituals play a role in our lives, and when you have a kid, then what, how you want to be the teller of stories as well. So. What I thought I would do before entering into our conversation was just read a very little bit from the beginning of the book that will give you a sense of what I mean when I say that this book is, is more than anything a story. When I was young, I would often spend the weekend at my grandmother's house. On the way in, Friday night, she would lift me from the ground in one of her fire smothering hugs. And on the way out, Sunday afternoon, I was again taken into the air. It wasn't until years later that I realized she was weighing me. My grandmother survived the war barefoot, scavenging other people's inedibles, rotting potatoes, discarded scraps of meat, skins, and the bits that clung to bones and pits. And so she never cared if I colored outside the lines as long as I cut coupons along the dashes and hotel buffets. While the rest of us erected golden calves of breakfast, she would make sandwich upon sandwich, 
to swaddle in napkins and stash in her bag for lunch. It was my grandmother who taught me that one tea bag makes as many cups of tea as you're serving and that every part of the apple is edible. Her obsession was not with money. Many of those coupons I clipped were for foods she would never buy and her obsession was not with health. She would beg me to drink Coke. My grandmother never set a place for herself at family dinners, even when there was nothing more to be done, no soup bowls to be topped off, no pots to be stirred or ovens checked. She stayed in the kitchen like a vigilant guard or prisoner in a tower. As far as I could tell, the sustenance she got from the food she made didn't require her to eat it. In the forests of Europe, she ate to stay alive until the next opportunity to eat to stay alive. In America, 50 years later, we ate whatever pleased us. Our cupboards were filled with food bought on whims, overpriced foodie food, food we didn't need. And when the expiration date passed, we threw it away without smelling it. Eating was carefree. My grandmother made that life possible for us, but she was herself unable to shake the desperation. Food for her was not food. It was terror, dignity, gratitude, vengeance, joyfulness, humiliation, religion, history, and of course, love as if the fruits she always offered us were picked from the destroyed branches of our family tree. About half an hour after my son was born, I went into the waiting room to tell the gathered family the good news. You said he, so it's a boy. What's his name? Who does he look like? Tell us everything. I answered their questions as quickly as I could, then went to a corner and turned on my cell phone. Grandma, I said, we have a baby. Her only phone is in the kitchen. She picked up after the first ring, which meant she'd been sitting at the table waiting for the call. It was just after midnight. Had she been clipping coupons or preparing her chicken and carrots to freeze for someone else to eat at some future meal? I'd never once seen or heard her cry, but tears pushed through her words as she asked, how much does it weigh? <laughs> a few days after we came home from the hospital, I sent a letter to a friend, including a photo of my son and some first impressions of fatherhood. He responded simply, Everything is possible again. It was the perfect thing to write because that was exactly how it felt. The world itself had another chance. And to end the reading, I'm going to read a very small bit that's in my grandmother's voice. Now, this um, I dictated about a year and a half ago when I was writing this book, but when I say that I went to her house for weekend stays, this is what I would hear all the time. We spent, if we weren't sleeping, we were at her kitchen table. That's what we did. It was like her chalkboard. That was where all the lessons were learned. And we would play a game called Uno. I don't know if you have that here. It's a card game. And I don't know, maybe we played 200 games a day, something like that. <laughs> and I would go two times a month, so let's say 400 games a month. And I did this, so in a year, that would be like 4,800, let's say 5,000. And I probably did this for 10 years, so 50,000 games of Uno. <laughs> I won every single one of those 50,000 games of Uno, um, which makes me very, very good at Uno. <laughs> so this is what she said, and this is verbatim. We weren't rich, but we always had enough. Thursdays, we baked bread and challah and rolls, and they lasted the whole week. Friday, we had pancakes. Shabbat, we always had a chicken and soup with noodles. You'd go to the butcher and ask for a little more fat. The fattiest piece was the best piece. It wasn't like now. We didn't have refrigerators, but we had milk and cheese. We didn't have every kind of vegetable but we had enough. The things that you have here and take for granted. But we were happy, we didn't know any better, and we took what we had for granted too. And then it all changed. During the war, it was hell on earth, and I had nothing. I left my family, you know. I was always running, day and night, and there was never enough food. I became sicker and sicker from not eating. And I'm not just talking about being skin and bones. I had sores all over my body. It became difficult to move. I wasn't too good to eat from a garbage can. I ate the parts that others wouldn't eat. If you helped yourself, you'd survive. So I took whatever I could find. I ate things that I wouldn't tell you about. Even at the worst times, there were good people too. Someone taught me to tie the ends of my pants so I could fill the legs with any potatoes I was able to steal. I walked miles and miles like that because you never knew when you would be lucky again. The worst it got was near the end. A lot of people died right at the end, and I didn't know if I would make it another day. A farmer, a Russian, God bless him. He saw my condition, and he went into his house, and he came out with a piece of meat for me. He saved your life, I said. Well, I didn't eat it. You didn't eat it? It was pork. I wouldn't eat pork. <laughs> Why? 
I asked, and I knew the answer, and I was very angry at her, I have to say. What do you mean, why? What, because it wasn't kosher? Of course. But not even to save your life. And she said, if nothing matters, there's nothing to save. And that was really the um, thesis for this book, this if there's nothing matter, there's nothing to save. And, and there's certain times in life when we find ourselves um, you know, faced with a choice and, um, and, and, and at, at risk is, is actually our humanity you know, or something very fundamental to our humanity. So I'm not a philosopher. I'm not an animal person. I'm not an activist. I'm not an environmentalist, really. I really wrote this book as just a person, just an eater, um, and most immediately as a new father. And... Um, and I found a situation that I felt like I couldn't not say no to without really losing something about myself. Um, animal agriculture is the number one cause of global warming. It's responsible for 51% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. So it's responsible, it plays a larger role in global warming than everything else put together. Um, the United Nations, in a study called Livestock's Long Shadow, said that animal agriculture is one of the top two or three causes of every significant environmental problem in the world, locally and globally. Air pollution, water pollution, deforestation, loss of biodiversity. This is not a marginal position. You don't have to be uh, an environmental activist to say that this matters. You know, you don't have to be liberal or progressive and you don't have to be conservative and you don't have to live in a city and you don't have to live in the country and you don't have to be young and you don't have to be old and you don't have to be religious or secular. It just matters. It matters in a very fundamentally human way. And what we're doing to animals on these farms is really as bad as anything humans have ever done to animals and it's on a massive scale. We factory farm 50 billion animals every year and as a rule, we treat them in ways that would be illegal if they were cats or dogs. We have um, genetically modified turkeys to such an extent that they can't reproduce sexually. Um, we have genetically modified our chickens such that animals that would live 10 years in nature can't be allowed to live more than about 42 days or their bones will start breaking and their tendons will, st will start slipping because they grow too quickly. Um, we keep pregnant sows, um, pe pregnant pigs, excuse me, in, um, in cages so small they can't turn around. It doesn't take one it doesn't take a love of animals to say that's just not right. To keep a pregnant animal in a cage so small it can't turn around, that's just not right. Um, and it matters. And the effects on human health are really staggering as well. It's the number one cause of food poisoning. In America, 76 million people become sick every year from eating food. And the Center for Disease, Disease Control has said that animal agriculture is the prime culprit. We know very clearly there's a lucid connection between antibiotic use for animals and their ineffectiveness for humans. We know that it's true, and yet we continue to feed it to them as a rule. We know that H1N1, which has you know, now ravaged the planet, fortunately, um, if one can say that, in such a way that only tens of thousands of people will die as opposed to hundreds of millions of people. And there's absolutely no reason that it wasn't hundreds of millions. There's no reason at all. And we know it originated on a factory hog farm in North Carolina. Um, we know that women who drink conventional milk are three times as likely to have twins as women who drink organic milk. Um, this is really scary stuff, and what's most scary is what we don't know. We're making science experiments out of ourselves, and we're making science experiments out of our kids, and we don't have to. We don't have to do any of this. We don't have to take part in this environmental destruction. We don't have to take part in this violence, and we don't have to take part in this great human science experiment. It doesn't require us to go vegetarian to withdraw from that. Unfortunately, this conversation is really often cast in, in absolutist terms, like, are you a vegetarian or are you not? As if those are the only two options. Either you care completely or you care not at all. And, and that's very silly and it's very destructive. And one of my hopes with this book was to find a new way to talk about this subject that reflects this very broad consensus that exists. 96% of Americans think animals deserve some legal protection. And I imagine the number is actually higher here. Everyone, even if you deny that global warming is happening, you admit that it would, be, it would matter if it were, and you admit that the quality of the air we breathe matters and the quality of the water we drink matters. 
and I find it hard to believe that anyone doesn't care about human health. Um, and yet when we wrap these three things up in this very tidy package of food, it suddenly becomes marginal to care, or you become odd. You know, I don't eat meat. Why don't you eat meat? What's wrong with you? People have been doing it forever. People do it everywhere. It's natural. It's human. And we need to find a way to talk about it that not only reflects the central place it has on our plates, for most of us twice a day, but also these shared values that we all have that um, transcend nationality, race, religion, gender, and age. These are things that we really all agree on. And, um, and if we can move away from thinking about vegetarianism or being a carnivore and move toward, you know, how can I um, withdraw from this problem? How can I not give it my money, not give it my vote, not put it in my body, and participate in the creation of a different kind of world? Um, because there is something that's worth saving in us. Um, you know, when my grandmother said, if, if nothing matters, there's nothing worth saving, this is such a thing that matters. And, and that's why I took four years away from a career I was very, very happy with and found gr very gratifying um, because, because I, I took to heart the moral of her story. So I think at that point we can, I'll, I'll move over there and we'll, we'll start our conversation. So thank you. All right, um, does anyone have a, a watch I can borrow? Um, you'll get it back, but it's so I can see what, what time it is. Ah, that's pretty nice. I, I, was, I was almost there as becoming a vegetarian, and then I was doing something really terrible at the moment the John Adams Institute called me. I was sitting in a restaurant in Paris, and I just ordered the foie gras, and then as a sign of Allah, they called up and said, you want to interview Jonathan Serfin Four? It's about eating animals. I thought, this is a sign. Um, do you think you always have to be right? Do you think that it's, it's you know, you say, if nothing else matters, nothing's, uh, um, you know, it, you got to care about things, but do you have to care always? Is it something you can ask of people? I think you can, I think we have to care always. It doesn't mean we have to do the right thing always. I mean, I'm a terrible hypocrite. I, there are a million things I do in the course of a day with, with relative to this issue, I mean, I continue to eat at sometimes um, um, eggs and dairy, and, and I'm frankly really not proud of that. It's, it's the full extension of this argument. I don't have some reason for making an exception except that I'm sometimes a hypocrite. I'm not, it takes time, it's hard, it's not easy. It's not, you can't just acknowledge that something is right and do it. Humans don't work like that. Um, so I, I, I have to feel great sympathy for people who are hypocritical because I'm one of them. That having been said, what I have, really don't have sympathy for is, is the person who I also am, sometimes by the way, who says, I just don't want to know about it. You know, like I get letters in the mail for charities and they have a picture of some hungry kid. And I say, I just don't want to know about it. I just right now I don't want to know about it. And I'll put, I'll put the letter in, in the recycling. Um, and I'm not proud of that, and that's not the way to be, but you know, life is a series of approximations. It's very rare in life that you flip a switch and change. And the most we can hope for, it seems, is to, like, you know, you got it wrong. It's like Beckett says, uh, try, fail, try again, fail better. Um, you just wanna keep failing better. You know, like get it a little less wrong. And it took me 20 years to become a vegetarian. That's a lot of time. But a lot of people, they, they are vegetarian for about two years and then they sin one time and they get right back into eating meat all the time, which is, I think, rather strange. You'd rather be a sinner for once and get back to, you know, being a vegetarian or whatever you do. It is odd, and I think it has to do with this, this, this dichotomy we've set up. Like, well, I couldn't be a vegetarian who eats meat, so I must not be a vegetarian. So I'm not a vegetarian, so I'll eat meat. You know, as if those were the only two choices, when in fact... Those are the choices at the very ends of the spectrum, and there's this huge middle for, you know, well, I'm somebody who doesn't eat meat on Fridays, or I'm somebody who doesn't eat meat for lunch, or I'm somebody who doesn't eat red meat, or I'm someone who doesn't eat fish. There are innumerable ways that one can make a bit of a difference, and if you applied that logic to anything else in life, it would seem so foolish. Like, um, you know, I try to be an honest person. Um, my mother comes down the stairs, and says, do I look nice in this dress? And I'm like, Meh. but I say, oh yeah, you look, you look, you look great. And 
So now, does that give me permission to lie at every available opportunity? No, of course not. You know, you, you do your best. Um, and there are infringements and there's hypocrisy. So if we could move away from thinking about the last step and move toward thinking about the first step, you know, not what's my identity, not what do I say if someone asks me, do I eat meat, but what's my next meal going to be? What's available to me and what's a choice that will best reflect what I care about and who I am? So is there anything you would want from the readers? Is there any uh, uh, target in the book in that way? You say it's, it's, you're not an activist, it's, it's maybe not a pamphlet, but do, do you want anything from your reader? Well, there's something I didn't say at the beginning, which I should have, which is this book really addresses factory farming more than it does meat in general. So factory farming, for those of you who don't know, is a method of animal agriculture that was invented in America in the 1920s and proliferated around the world in the last 50 years. And there's no one definition for it, but it usually involves raising many, 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 many animals in the tens of thousands, sometimes in the hundreds of thousands, in small enclosures, um, usually windowless sheds. The feed is automated. They are genetically modified. They are fed antibiotics or other antimicrobials. And um, there's environmental destruction built into the business model and there's also um, neg negative human health effects built into the business model. In America now, 99% of the animals that are raised for meat are raised on factory farms. In Germany, it's 98%. Um, my impression is here it's about 98, 97%. Um, so when we, you know, in a way, it's as if I am just talking about meat. But the fact that this other 1% exists, these small and family farms, makes a kind of rigid philosophical argument against meat impossible because there is another way, you know, and it happens to be the way that humans had done it for tens of thousands of years until 50 years ago. There is another way of doing it. Um, so if there's something that I'm asking of readers, it's to, it's to examine factory farming and to say, is this a product that I can feel comfortable giving my money to and um, putting in my body? So the, the, the actual question which a lot of people pose, you know, whether it's right in general to kill animals and eat them, is, is a question you move away from a bit. You know, you don't really get into that question. I just don't think, I don't think it's the important question, and I think it's very divisive. If I were to ask this audience, do you think it's right to eat animals, maybe half would say yes, maybe half would say no. People would start getting upset and agitated and angry at each other. If I were to say, do you think it's right to keep a pregnant animal for the duration of its pregnancy in a cage so small it can't turn around? I doubt anybody would say yes. You know, I doubt it. If I were to say, do we need a farm system that doesn't produce 51% of our greenhouse gases? Most people would say, we need something different. If I were to say, do we need a farm system that doesn't, as a practice, make us ill? People would say yes. So that is the reality that we're contending with. That is the choice in front of us. So that's, that's what we should be talking about. You, you really did a lot of research. You really went out to, to see the farms and try to get into the slaughterhouses. Um, how, how much did you really get to see? How, how often did you really come in? Uh, it's totally impossible. Um, and everyone, everyone here who, who feels like it, and I can't really imagine anybody would, but if you feel like it, um, and if you eat meat, go home, open your refrigerator, look at the package, see the name, and just call the company, get a phone number, and just say, hey, I am, you know, Joe Consumer, and I've been eating your product for years. I've put a lot of money in your pocket, and I'm just kind of curious where it comes from. Is that weird of me? I don't think so. Um, think there's any chance I could go see your farm. If you were to ask the maker of your apple juice, they would say, yeah, sure, that could be arranged. If you were to ask the maker of your, you know, loaf of bread, they would say, yeah, sure, come behind the counter. We'll show you the machines. If you ask the producer of your meat, they will say no. I promise you they will say no. And that is suspicious at least and, and maddening. I mean, it, it, it makes, made me very angry. And an industry that's asking us to give, a, give them its money, f eat the products, feed them to our kids, and they, they don't trust us to see where it comes from, or there's something that they, they simply can't allow to be made public, that's not, that in and of itself, no matter what's behind that locked door, that to me is enough to, 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 to cause one to reject it. Was there any point in your research where you doubted your own, uh, you know, there was a way you were going, and you, or you doubted your own opinions, where you thought, well, maybe I'm starting to uh, shift on that one? I had a hard time when I went to um, these very good farms. I was surprised by how good they were, and I was surprised by how 
I couldn't find a very good argument against them. I had assumed that, yeah, there's something, there's something wrong. In fact, there are plenty of good arguments against them when you're thinking about what kind of system you want to create, what kind of culture you want to um, be a part of. But that a specific piece of meat that comes from a specific farm where a farmer treats his animals like we treat our dogs and cats, and there are such farms where animals are fed foods that they naturally eat, fed as much as they want. They are given medical attention when they're ill, but they're not given medical attention when they're not ill. Um, uh, a farm that's environmentally sustainable um, and that produces healthy food. I mean, these things exist. Like, it exists. It's not just a hypothetical. But it's such an insanely small part of the picture, and one can never be sure that that's what you're actually getting. That, you know, that, that, that makes me feel like, well, when I think about the system as a whole, I don't want to get involved. It's like child labor. You know, I can imagine a situation in which it would be beneficial to give a five-year-old a job. You know, there are such five-year-olds on this planet. But it doesn't mean I would advocate child labor. Um, because when we're thinking about, you know, how we want to legislate, what kind of, you know, world we want to create, we don't go to the exceptions. We don't find the needle in the haystack. We think about the hay. And um, anytime you have a system where there's such a huge differential between those who have power and those who don't, like adults and children, and any time there are such really massive incentives to abuse that power, like with meat, um, it will always be abused. It's not to say that every farmer will be corrupted because there will be great farmers. There will. But as a system, it will be corrupted, and we don't want to... We don't want but, to. But if you compare a cow on a good farm to a zebra in the, you know, where do they live? Jungles? No, they live in, um, well, Africa. Well, if you compare the two, you know, nature and, um, and a good farm, which, which will be better off? That, that is a good question, I think. Well, a good farm is better than nature. I mean, you would much prefer Because you have much, you don't have any stress. You get your food, everything's good. Yeah, but those aren't the choices. I mean, that's not, we're not bringing cows into existence to save them from nature. You know, that's not what we're doing. <laughs> we're bringing them into existence so that we can um, kill them and eat them, and we shouldn't yeah. pretend it's anything else. So I guess I don't find that argument very captivating, that, well, nature is cruel. Well, nature isn't our moral guide. You know, animals rape other animals in nature. Animals are constantly, you know, torturing other animals in nature. And by the way, they don't have microphones and audiences in nature, and we seem to have transcended that tonight for good reason. You know, human progress is precisely the transcendence of nature. Um, it is precisely when we resist, um, you know, our impulses in the interest of either intellectual or ethical pursuits. Um, one of the things you, you seem to say in the book is that it's, it's a, there's a bigger plot to it, that the government seems to be on the side of the, uh, of, of the big farms and of the big uh, meat industry. Uh, can you explain that a bit more, why you, you think that the government's on their side? And it's not my opinion, it's just a fact. I mean, the government's job is to endorse industry. And American industry is 99% factory farming. So, you know, the government, unfortunately, is wearing too many hats at one time. When I say the government, I really mean the USDA, the Department of Agriculture. So they are tasked with endorsing industry, supporting industry, um, and protecting consumers, and actually protecting animals. Um, and those three things um, um, do not overlap, or they do not always overlap, and sometimes they very directly contradict each other. It is not in the interest of industry always to do what's best for animals or consumers. And so what we need is another branch of government, you know, like a food, a food ministry, someone who, uh, a, a, a department whose task is um, simply to protect consumers and to protect animals, even at the expense of industry. But in the end, that will end up on the side of the meat industry too, probably, if there is any such bigger plot. I don't think it's a plot. Um, I don't think that there are people, you know, conspiring in, in rooms. This is, this is all that we have in America. So what are we going to do? I mean, are they going to just, you know, they're not going to dismantle it tomorrow. I think they're going to dismantle it because of a, like a bottom-up um, desire, which is happening right now. The fastest growing sector in the food industry in America, and I don't just mean in Berkeley or in New York, but in all of America, is cage-free eggs. And they don't taste any better, and they're not better for us. People want them because it's, it's just the right thing. You know, nobody needs to explain to us that it's wrong to put 12 animals in a tiny cage for their entire life. It's just, it's wrong. You know, we, we know it. Fundamentally, we know it. 
and people are asking for something different, and now you really cannot go to a supermarket anywhere in America and not find cage-free eggs. Um, and this is gonna happen, this is already happening, but it's gonna happen more and more as college students and high school students who are disproportionately vegetarian and also interested in this issue. 18% of college students in America are vegetarians. They're more vegetarians than Catholics in American universities. Um, <laughs> I don't know why that's in and of itself a great thing that deserves applause, but I didn't say more than axe murderers. But anyway, there are um, more vegetarians than any major of study. You know, There's a lot of people. That's a, that's a huge body of people. And the 18% has been growing annually, will continue to grow. And when they become culture makers, when they are on this stage and when they are journalists and when they are politicians and lawyers and doctors, this will all feel very different. You know, the conversation will take a different shape. Um, it's not going to happen in Ukraine, though. I, I had to think of the uh, scene in uh, Everything's Illuminated where someone tried to order a vegetarian meal in, in Ukraine, which I found very funny. Which uh, um, you, you, Do you remember where it was? You, you wrote the book. Uh, <laughs> you know, I wrote the book, but I wrote it 10 years ago. Um, the fact of the matter is I wouldn't be able to find it without... Um, becoming engrossed in some other scene in the book and saying, oh my goodness, that's so interesting. <laughs> how funny, how clever. But um, <laughs> no, I, don't, I really, I actually don't know where it is in this book. And the book was designed in such a way that it's very difficult to find things. Um, <laughs> because a lot of pages are just like this. There's no paragraph breaks or indentations. It's just blocks of text. So it's as if nine years ago I was thinking, how could I make it most difficult for my future self to find a particular <laughs> section. You said this book is a, is a, um, it's a story, it's not, not journalism, it's not philosophy, it's not science. Why, why do you think it's a story? I think it has components of journalism in it and components of philosophy, but you know, ultimately it comes down to what we make of all of these words. You know, a word like suffering, you know, what does that mean? We can measure pain response in animals, we can say that um, a pig, for example, has a brain structure that's very similar to a human's, and that when we look at a human brain, when a human is in pain, it's doing things that are almost identical to what a pig brain does when a pig seems to be in pain. So that's the journalism. But what does that tell us? It doesn't, it doesn't actually tell us anything. It tells us that pigs exhibit pain response, but they could be faking it, or, I mean, no, I mean, I say this not jokingly. This is, you would be surprised how many people believe that. Um, it could be that they're just exhibiting, you know, reflexes, but not experiencing any suffering in a meaningful way, in the way that we talk about it. And so, in order to understand that problem, we can't appeal to numbers. We can't appeal to statistics. We have to appeal to something within us, actually, which is what's our definition of suffering. And each of us has a different one, and it's based on these assumptions that we make about other beings in the world. So, if you... Um, you know, get your, your thumb caught in a door. And you say, ah! So I have two choices. I have actually many choices, but the two obvious ones are I can believe that you're in pain or I can doubt that you're in pain. Um, you want me to believe that you're in pain and I want you to believe me when I seem to be. Um, we depend on each other to make generous assumptions, not miserly assumptions. We depend on each other to have an outward flowing understanding of suffering, not a solipsistic one. And, you know, it's the same with animals. I think there is a perfectly coherent way to describe the thrashing about of a pig that is, you know, being cut open. One could describe that as reflex. One could describe that as Descartes described it, as just like the cogs in a machine, you know, kind of going nuts and nothing more than that. Or one could be a different sort of person and say, I don't know, I will never know, but I want to be someone who assumes a lot, you know, especially when the expense to me is so little and the price for the pig would seem to be so high. So I'm going to assume that it's in pain, that it, that it is feeling what it is showing me that it is feeling. Um, and that's what I mean when I talk about story. That's just one example, but we have to find ways, and it often involves appealing to lessons our parents taught us or our grandparents. Um, we have to find ways to um, transcend the limits of of reason and the limits of language. And, and a lot of it is just, you know, figuring out who we are, what kind of people we want to be in the world. 
Was there anyone in the book that you would have wanted to write a novel about or who you wanted as a person in a novel who you found inspiring on that level? There are some pretty memorable people in the book, but I, I don't think I would want to write a novel about There was one Fagan who became the owner of a slaughterhouse, which I thought <laughs> quite yeah. strange. He's inter an interesting guy. There was a young animal activist, a young woman, who, so to get into factory farms, I was saying it's very difficult. The way I did it was um, I found animal activists around the country, and I would go with them in the middle of the night, and we'd climb fences, and it was very scary and kind of exciting. And um, there was this one who I met who I refer to as C in the book, because man, oh man, she would go to jail, and they would throw away the key if they really <laughs> found out who she was. Um, and she's a very captivating personality. She's a young woman. She's in her 20s. And I think she speaks very eloquently about these questions. I don't always agree with her, but she poses a lot of, she puts the, she puts the problem in some very extreme terms, which are, which are arresting, they're captivating, they make you think. You, you wrote this because you became a father. Um, is, it, is it difficult to write when you're a father? Because kids tend to make noise and stuff, and they don't <laughs> care if their father's a writer or not. Oh, well, it's just difficult to write, first of all. I mean, have you ever heard the old saying? I might have said this at John Adams Institute last time because I'm so fond of it, that um, writing is like um, pulling teeth out of your penis. You ever heard that? <laughs> um, writing is a very, very difficult thing, and having kids uh, does not facilitate anything except for being a parent. Um, having kids is the best possible way to become a parent, but it is the worst way to do anything else. And, um, but that's okay, so you lose 18 years, you know, what's the big deal? Okay, but, but normally there's, there's, you know, one of the two parents who's a writer, but you're both writers, so you, do you have to take terms on who's writing and who's keeping the kids down? Um, as it turns out, it's a two-person job, so neither of us have really written. Um, no, but you know, it's like Hillary Clinton said, it takes a village, it, you, it's a job that expands to fit the space that it's given. So, you know, single parents do it, and they manage. And if, you have, if we had 10 people in our house, it would occupy 10 people full time. You, you say you feel more responsible um, when it comes to questions like these because you're a parent. Can you explain that? Because I'm not a parent and I don't think I'll ever be you, so maybe, you know? <laughs> never say never, um, unless you've had some kind of operation. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I don't even remember what you asked. Uh, why, is it, why is it harder? Um, well, it just matters more. I mean, I will reach for a Coke. I'll reach for French fries. I'll reach for just about anything. It's not a big deal to me. You know, if there are situations in which I would do all kinds of things that I would really not want for my son or my sons, um, it's not to say that they won't, you know, drink Coke and have fries and maybe smoke a cigarette and maybe do other things, but um, it's not what the way I want to structure my house, our home. You know, they're not the habits that I want to instill. And um, it's like when I was talking about, you know, I, I went through this swinging pendulum for 20 years and I didn't want a swinging pendulum for my son. It's okay. It's not the worst thing in the world to be inconsistent but it's a lot better to know what you think about things and to act on your values. So the goal in raising a child, for me, is not to create a replica of me. It's not to um, have him grow up to have all of my values. It's to have him grow up to act on his own values. You know, that was the moral of my grandmother's story. It wasn't be kosher. That wasn't her point, as much as she might like that. Um, her point was, do the thing you believe in, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it's you know, socially awkward, even if it's inconvenient, even if it's expensive, and even if in the most extreme cases, you have to risk your own well-being. Well, in this situation, we don't have to risk our own well-being. It doesn't have to be more expensive, and the social awkwardness is something we're all capable of getting over. Um, and very soon, I think the social awkwardness is gonna be in the other direction. Um, so it's, it's a value that we have, that I, I really believe is a, these are universal values, the, that the environment matters, animals matter, human health matters, and, um, and we have the opportunity to act on those values, and because we are the first generation that really became fully aware 
of what factory farming is, we have a special kind of responsibility to respond to it because we, our children and grandchildren will ask, what did you do when you learned about it? You know, did you support it or did you withdraw from it? If, if anyone wants to ask any uh, questions, you can, you know, I don't know how we're going to do it, but you can come up front and ask your question or... Uh Maybe if you speak up, you can... Uh, oh, there's a, there's a microphone there, so you can just... Uh, if anyone's got any questions, please step forward and, and um, we'll see about it. You, now that you got the, the teeth out of your penis um, and you got to Amsterdam, how is it to do such a um, tour as a writer? And, and do, do you like it? You go to a lot of cities. You're, you're in Amsterdam. You're in Antwerp tomorrow. You're, you go to Denmark, I think. Do, do you like going there? Is it hectic for you? Oh, I think it's just the most exciting thing in the world, actually. I mean, mm. I spent four years writing a book in my bed and at a <laughs> desk in, in a public library and, you know, sometimes in a bathtub. And the thought of somebody reading those words in a bed or at a desk or in a bathtub of this very solitary, very, very intimate activity, finding a mirror or a connection in, in this intimate activity is is really exhilarating and frankly it's hard to believe every single time i mean the idea that i, I would i would say every every time i encounter a reader it's like the first reader i've ever encountered i, I really mean that it's just um it's a very special thing right anyone um please don't be too shy on that you know. Uh, good evening. Uh, you said at the beginning you said something like uh, things can compel you to go to war, or so it seems. Would you like to expand on that? I knew. I just knew <laughs> when I said that. As it was coming out of my mouth, I thought some Dutch person is going to ask me what I meant by that. Um, and now I sound like like a um, you know warmongering American, probably. Um, well, I think World War II, let's say, is a decent example. Um, I think that we were compelled to fight the Nazis and, um, and uh, you know, I, I don't know, do people disagree with that? It's that? That seems like a very compelling case to me. <laughs> Anyone? Hi. <laughs> Can't God? see you. Well, you know, that was not Sinclair Lewis's aim, by the way. His aim was to awaken people to workers' rights in the um, slaughterhouses. He said, I, what did he say? I aim for their hearts and I hit their stomachs. Um, and uh, it, was, it was simply not what he was intending. Uh, it was not what I was intending as much as I would like that to happen, but I'm not so naive to think that, you know, the Obamas or anybody within a stone's throw of them are, you know, staying up late reading this book. I... I hope that it is part of something that is clearly going on right now. You really cannot open a major newspaper um, without in the course of a week coming across some news item that has to do with this. So a couple weeks ago, the New York Times editorialized that um, tuna should be reclassified as an endangered species. That's insane. I mean, a lot of people read that and said, tuna, an endangered species? Well, that's insane. I'm going to stop eating fish. Um, the UK climate chief the week before that, said in an interview, and this man is not a vegetarian and he's not an animal activist, said that the only way to save the planet is going to be a global movement toward vegetarianism. There have been articles in the Times in the last two weeks about massive um, ground beef recalls, about cases of um, children dying of E. coli, of how our public school system has become the depository of all the garbage factory farm crap that the rest of us don't want to eat and that really shouldn't even be dog food. Um, so it's in the news all the time. The environmental case in particular is now becoming 
really impossible to ignore. Um, I, when I say that there's a piece of news about this, I have yet to read a piece of news that would um, encourage one to eat factory farm products. Every single news item would encourage one to, to move away from them. So I think legislation will be part of the answer, but I don't have all that much faith in it happening anytime soon. I mean, it's nice to think that, you know, just as we don't need the option to buy toys um, painted with lead paint, we don't need the option to buy Chilean sea bass. Um, we don't need the option to buy um, the meat from, you know, animals that are put in cages too small to turn around. Um, we don't need the option to buy a food that um, is making our antibiotics ineffective. It's nice to imagine that, but I don't think that's, it's going to happen like that. I think it's going to happen by, you know, one meal at a time, just people saying no, one meal at a time. Do you, do you think you're part of a tradition? There's been a lot of writers like Sinclair Lewis who wrote about uh, animals, about uh, the relationship between human beings and animals. Do you, do you, did you take any um, study in, in those other writers who did the same thing? Not especially. I mean, there is a long tradition of writers caring about this issue. You know, everyone from Kafka to Bruno Schultz to J.M. Kotzea, um, Jonathan Franzen. In a way, if, if writers, whose very practice it is, to be empathetic, to imagine oneself into someone else's or something else's position in life, if writers can't make that step, that relatively small step that um, is necessary in order to say, hey, something is not right here, then it's hard to imagine anybody else making it. So um, Jonathan Franzen and I started something um, two years ago called Airland Sea, where we s it's three charities one having to do with air, it's the American Bird Conservancy, one having to do with land, it's a group called Farm Forward, and one C, which is Oceana. And um, we asked writers if they would donate the proceeds from one paid event. Writers often do paid lectures. This, you know, is not a paid lecture, but um, writers often do these paid lectures. And um, every single writer we asked said yes, you know, every, every last one. So um, I think there's a kind of caring that's involved in writing that, that exercises the very same muscles as are used when we care about where our food comes from. Anyone got a question? Hi. Well, you know, that book took quite a long time, actually, to um, have the effect that it did. And these things grow by means of conversation, by people saying, hey, this really matters to me. I think it might matter to you. They don't, it's not because of reviews or, you know, a marketing plan or how many books are printed in the first edition. It's because people believe that it matters and believe that it will matter to people that they care about. So, um, I have no idea what will happen. It's obviously, it would be wonderful to think of it as being a piece in this puzzle. Um, you know, the reality of our, of our culture now is it's difficult for books. It's difficult for books to reach very wide audiences when they're not, you know, about wizards, basically. Um, <laughs> and, 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 um, and it's been quite a long time since we've had political books um, that, have, that, have, that have changed people in any broad way. But I w of course, that would be my. I would. I would. I would love that. Who, what did somebody say? Oh, Sinclair Lewis. That mistake must have been made a hundred million times in human history.
Um, I have had only one kind of hostile response, and that has been from um, animal rights people, actually, that the book um, or my position isn't sufficiently um, based in animal rights. You know, it's much more based in animal welfare. Um, and that's all the hostility I've had. I'm very surprised by that. I thought I was going to go to readings and somebody, I, I had this plan, okay, what am I going to do if somebody throws a piece of meat at me? I, I don't know why I, I became fixated on this possibility. And I was like, what's the right move? What's the right move? Well, the right move is they throw the meat, a security guard goes to remove the guy, and I say, no, 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 no that won't be necessary. That won't be necessary. Come on up. And I get the guy on stage, and we split the piece of meat into two, and I say that we have a meat duel, and we stand back to back and walk 10 paces and turn around and throw it at each other. And I thought, that's what, that's what I'll do. That never happened. Um, nobody has stood up and gotten angry at me except for animal rights people. And the industry has been like pin drop silence, you know, totally silence. And basically they, the way they work is either they unleash all of their dogs and, and sue you into oblivion, which could still happen, um, or they don't say anything because it's not in their interest to say something without going all the way because it just generates more conversation. And they will only sue if they feel like a lesson needs to be made. Um, I'm not too terribly worried, actually, because I was so conservative with my facts and fact-checking. I had two independent fact-checkers corroborate every statistic that I use, and I really only use the most conservative ones available. Um, but, I mean, again, it's kind of instructive. It's informative, like these locked doors, like the um, impossibility of going to visit a farm. The fact that they haven't said anything, you know, they haven't refuted a single point, um, it says really two things at once. One, that there is no refutation. And two, that they know that if people think about this and talk about it, they are going to um, not be on their side. And so um, an industry that depends on silence and willful ignorance and forgetting, you know, what kind of industry is that? Um, I found the, the cultural aspect of eating that you talk about one of the most profound things you mention in your book. And I think people really struggle with that when they're with their family and friends and making a decision that's going to disrupt kind of a, a harmonious occasion. Um, I'm just wondering if you've thought about that more in the time you've written the book. Um, did you stop eating your grandma's chicken and carrots? I have thought about it quite a bit. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with how this conversation is broached and where it happens. So the best place to talk about the Thanksgiving turkey is not at the Thanksgiving table. Um, and a lot of people make that mistake. Um, I do not think that much good comes from one individual trying to persuade another individual. I just don't think it happens. I don't think, it, I, I, I have not heard many cases of that working and it's never worked for me. Um, the people who have changed me most are the ones who do it just by example and very subtly. You know, I witness, hey, my friend, you know, he, he told me he doesn't buy stuff online. That's kind of interesting. He always goes to the neighborhood store. <laughs> maybe I'll ask him why, maybe not. But his example, it's, it, it can like infiltrate your, your consciousness. And um, I think that's how change happens. And it's why it's so very, very important, I think, not to eat even good meat in public. Because someone sees you eating salmon, they don't ask, is that farm salmon? Is that wild salmon? Actually, salmon's a great example because farm salmon was created to relieve pressure from wild salmon populations because fishery scientists recognized that they're simply, we were going to run out of salmon. And so why don't we create this additional stock? But what happened, strangely, was the pressure on wild salmon increased as factory fishing, fish farms became more prevalent because people saw people eating salmon. and It was more available in the salmon habit fed off of itself. And when you see someone at the next table eating salmon, you don't go up and say, is that sustainable? Is it unsustainable? Is that fished? Is it wild caught? You just say, there's another salmon eater. So um, nobody eats alone. You know, it's a very, I guess one of the, the most important points I think in the book is that, you know, whether we're feeding kids or whether we think we're eating alone at our own little table in the corner of a restaurant, um, nobody eats alone. You know, we're part of this web of connections where people witness what other people are doing and the market responds to all of that. So, um, so I, I really believe in like a, in a, like a softly spoken, non-aggressive and frankly non-argumentative approach, like a conversational approach. If people ask me why I do what I do, I'm very happy to explain it to them, but I don't explain it to them if they don't ask me.
This relates well to my question. I was going to ask you, uh, factory farmed meat is not the only source of meat. There is a small and growing organic meat movement, which you could also equally well argue deserves our support. Well, organic can be factory farmed. There's nothing about organic that implies that it's not factory farmed. Um, yeah, I think it deserves our support, perhaps in the same way that finding those five-year-olds' jobs deserves our support. I mean, it's the exception, and it is so much better than the rule. And if somebody, you know, just, if somebody is going to eat meat, if there's no way around it, I'm going to eat meat, then, man, the world would be so much better off if you bought meat from small farmers, from family farms. And um, the problem with small and family farms, there are a couple problems, but the biggest is that it can't be replicated globally. There just isn't enough land to keep all of our animals on pasture, and um, it's too expensive. So, you know, maybe there's a sense in which it's just a hobby, or it's, um, it's something for, you know, people who have that option to indulge. If, if all meat in the world were somehow like that, I wouldn't have written my book. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel so, so strongly about this. But it will never occupy the majority of the market, not at this point, not with this many people, and it will never be able to be applied globally. On top of which, there is no way around many of the environmental effects. You know, whether um, a cow is raised on pasture or on a feedlot, it produces methane, and methane is one of the most potent greenhouse gases. So when we talk about the 51%, we're often, we're talking about methane, and we're talking about the transportation of these animals around the country. And there's just no way, there's no way around that. So as, you know, as global warming becomes more and more of a problem, we are just necessarily going to have to eat less. We are going to be forced to eat less. The question is, will we choose to or will we be forced to? And if we choose to, it's going to be a lot better than being forced to because being forced to will come at the expense of who knows what. You know, maybe by then our antibiotics will be totally ineffective. Maybe by then we'll become accustomed to regular outbreaks of avian and swine flu. Um, maybe by then food poisoning is something that's like flipping a coin when you go to a restaurant. You know, it's, we don't want that future. We don't want skyscrapers of animals. We don't want it. I, I can't help but wondering what will you do when your son turns nine? And he will say, well, dad, I want to eat meat just like my friends and the people in the restaurant. I'm just wondering. Um, I don't, I, to be honest, I don't know. Um, I mean, what if he says I want to lick electrical sockets? You know, I would say, no, you won't. <laughs> I want a drunk drive. My friends do that. Well, you're not going to do that. You're going to be different from your friends. Uh, I think what I'm going to say is in our house, we're not going to have it. And um, when he's old enough to make decisions for himself, he will make decisions for himself. I think if I tried to prevent him from doing so, it would be the very quickest way to encourage him to do so. Um, so, as I said, I don't want, I don't, I, it's not that I want to force him into my mold. You know, I just want him to think about these decisions, to recognize that there's a decision there, and to do the thing that he thinks is right. He'll come home from a party, he'll say, I had a hot dog, and I'll say, they're good, aren't they? I had tons of hot dogs when I was a kid. Um, should we talk about where hot dogs come from? You know, do you want to <laughs> think about it? It's interesting, and I'm sure he'll say yes at that point. It's interesting, people say to me, how, how, do, how do you explain to your kid that you don't eat meat? To me, it's like, how do you explain to your kid that you do? You know, like, man, I don't envy those parents, I don't. And this has nothing to do with whether it's right or wrong, by the way. This only has to do with the way that meat fits into all of the other lessons that we teach kids. I, nine out of 10 of the books that I read him at night have animals for heroes. He cries, he's got stuffed animals. We have a family dog, he kicks it, he gets in trouble. But we do dismember these things when we're hungry. And you know, we also keep them in these little cages and we cut off their appendages without anesthetic and so on and so forth. Obviously, I wouldn't get into that, but um, it is totally, totally, and totally out of sync with everything else we teach kids about what it means to be a responsible, kind person in the world. Again, that doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It's just a fact. So um, people say, how do you explain to your kid that you're a vegetarian? How do we explain that we don't kill animals to eat them? Very easy. We don't kill animals to eat them. You know, how does the parent who, who feeds his kid that stuff explain it? I think that's harder. And that's it's something I'm really grateful that I don't have to do because I, I 
you know, I, I know what that would be like, and I would feel crappy with the stories that I would tell. Uh, yeah, I had a question. Um, I visited a, a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture Farm, up in the Adirondacks, and um, a lot of the members of that farm had sort of defected from vegetarianism into eating meat again because, you know, they were active in the role that the, the farm played and everything, like what you described. Um, in your de in you making your decision not to be a selective omnivore, omnivore as they're called, um, and being vegetarian, what, what do you, how did you decide that, and what do you think it says about people that have gone the other way, essentially defected from vegetarianism? I mean, in theory, I respect those people. Um, I wonder, do they never eat meat when they go to restaurants? Do they never buy meat from supermarkets? Do they, is truly the only meat they consume? This is the problem with being a selective omnivore, is you're actually not that selective, you know? Like, well, I really prefer to buy this kind of meat. And yet, nine times out of 10, if you're lucky, you know, nine times out of 10, you're not gonna have that choice. In reality, it's probably more like, you know, 99 times out of 100. It's just, it's very rare, it's very hard to find. So does it make you a great guy that one out of 10 times you find the good stuff and then you pat yourself on the back and that excuses you to eat the bad stuff all the other times, you know? If one is really consistent, in that kind of lifestyle, I find that really admirable. I think that's good, and the world would be great if more people were like that. Unfortunately, I think it ends up being an excuse um, to really eat factory farmed crap most of the time, and you know, have the good stuff when you're on the farm with your buddies. Well, I uh, think that um, good stuff can be very good, and um, I am a student. I don't really have that much money to afford it all the time. But we can go back to the time where meat was only for those who had more money. And um, I think that, well, especially when I have my menstruation, I think I really need meat. <laughs> and uh, I have, like, these teeth here, and I really want some bloody thing into me. Uh, and I was raised by the thought that... Um, when you're little, you eat this uh, bouillon when you were sick or when you were ill, so it will make you stronger. Uh, I think that your body sometimes just needs it, don't you? Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's do the second part first. Um, listen, I don't have... I'm not you. I mean, I just don't, I don't know what it is to be you, and I'm not going to, I'm in no position to doubt anything you just said. Mm. Um, what I can say is that um, the best of science tells us that not only do we not need meat to be healthy, but that, um, generally speaking, it is healthier not to eat meat. We know definitively that vegetarians live longer, and if long life isn't a measure of healthfulness, it's hard to imagine what we're talking about when we talk about being healthy. The American Dietetic Association, which is uh, impartial, nonpartisan, nutritional um, advocacy group in America, says that um, a vegetarian diet is at least as healthy for every stage of life, from a newborn, lactating mother, menstruating woman, senior citizen, um, and for any walk of life, competitive athlete, lazy ass couch potato. Um, <laughs> Furthermore, and this is the surprise, vegetarians tend to have a more optimal protein intake than meat eaters. You know, this is the real nutritional myth. This is the, like the baseline one is that I need meat for energy. I need it for protein. It's just not true. I mean, the best of science tells us that that's not true. Is it possible that at certain times, in certain situations, your body craves it? Yeah, I totally believe that, sure. So eat it during those times and don't eat it at other times. But don't let those situations be excuses not to care, not to think about it the vast majority of the time when you're not menstruating. <laughs> Peace, God. Um, <laughs> I, your book is great. It's very convincing, yet it's not in your face, and I've, I've, I, li I like that about it. Um, could you say something about uh, leather? Leather? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know, 
<laughs> I was just thinking about how menstruating women like to wear leather. <laughs> um, no, leather. You know, the fact of the matter is I don't know the first thing about leather. Isn't that strange? I don't know anything about leather. I don't wear leather. Um, I just don't need it. I mean, I'm not a fashion horse, as you might have detected. Um, and, you know, it's funny. I went to the Nike store in Manhattan in Midtown, and I said, hey, I'm looking for some sneakers. Are these all made of leather? And I was like, oh, yeah, these are all leather. I was like, they're all leather? He's like, yeah, these are all leather. I was like, really? He's like, yeah. And I walked away, and I was standing there sort of thinking, and I saw him talking to a coworker, and he came up to me, and he said, they're not like leather leather. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? He's, not, he's like, they're not like animal skin leather. They're just like leather. Um, <laughs> so in fact, finding synthetic stuff is you, you, you do it almost by accident. I mean, I don't even know if Nike makes very, very, very few shoes that are genuine leather. Um, I don't know to what extent it's a byproduct of the meat industry, to what extent it's its own industry. It's just not something that I got into. It's probably, um, you know, quite, quite interesting and important. I just, it wasn't, it wasn't within the field of the vision of this book. Anyone, well, yeah? Yeah. Oh yeah. I shouldn't have said it. It was, you know, I was trying to be honest, but Well, well, you know, I'm I'm a vegetarian, but I eat foie gras, which is not very consequent. Um, but I think it's even less consequent if you do it the other way around, if you're meeting eating meat all the time and then you don't eat the foie gras. So um, <laughs> but um, it's not something you really feel good about. It tastes good, though, but it's not something you feel good about. And uh, I don't know. I think this year, when I'm in Paris with Christmas, I'll not order the foie gras anymore. I think the, my, my, my sense is the more somebody jokes, the, more they, the better an indication is that they agree with you. Um, like a joke is made out of discomfort. That's why people joke. They joke because they know you're right. And um, they're uncomfortable. And they're feeling you know, accused or attacked or pinned down. They want to escape. And a joke is a, kind of, is a technique of escape. It is, in, it, it's somewhat inevitable. I mean, it's a very common response to this. And I basically make a mental note that, you know, this person is some form of dumb fuck. And, um, <laughs> and I just get over it. I'm not, I mean, like, I'll tell you what doesn't work is saying, like, are you serious? You know, don't you know that animals are kept in cages? And, like, <laughs> it just doesn't work. The person is not receptive. Um, the person's, the joke is an indication of, like, a wall. And so that's fine. Like, let that person go. Go about your business. You're an idiot. It's not my, you know, I, I'm not married to you. You're not my brother. You're not my problem. Also, my convincing you isn't going to change anything in the world. It's going to expend a lot of energy. It's probably going to generate a fight. It'll make me pissed off. And it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. So I just walk away from the person. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. Haha. <laughs> you know, I laugh, make my mental note. And, um, <laughs> and then I go on to people who are, who are um, more worth talking to. One, one last question, because I think we, um, you ought to do some signing also, if you like. Um, my question is more of a, on a personal level. You went on this journey for four years, and you were saying that your, um, your wife is also a writer. I was wondering how she experienced it, your journey, and how it affected her. Just, and you know, having a partner and going through this big change. 
Well, I have to say, she had a very similar background. Um, we, we, she had also been a vegetarian on and off throughout her life. When we met, neither of us were vegetarians. And when we became engaged, we decided we wanted to make some change, like a symbolic or very practical change. And um, actually, Jewish ritual really encourages this. You know, in the marriage ceremony, you step on a glass and chatter it, and that announces the marriage. And there are many interpretations of what that symbolism is supposed to signify, but it usually has to do with demarcating an ending and, and a beginning, that things were one way before, and now they are a different way. And we wanted to make that real, and so we became um, vegetarians together when... Um, we were engaged. That having been said, we served meat at our wedding, and on our honeymoon in Japan, we ate fish, and then I was back to like my same old thing about, well, I sort of do this, I sort of don't do this, and then it wasn't until our, you know, she became pregnant with our son that we really together re-examined it, and, um, and I must have been very annoying in these last couple of years because I was constantly encountering the kinds of facts that one can't help but share. You know, I have a friend who just finished this book and was telling me, like every five minutes she would turn to her husband and say like, you're not going to believe what they do to this. They're like, can you believe this? And that was how I experienced three years. I was just, I, I went in with probably more knowledge about this than most people do. And I mean, every day something I learned something that I could only say, I can't believe that. I mean, really, like, this book is filled with such things. I can't believe that this is what we're doing. So that was, that was really like the, the sort of language in which I shared this journey with her, is you're never going to believe this. You're never going to believe this. And, and so we, we, you know, have now, I, we, she doesn't eat meet either, and we both um, are, feel like we're in the process of transitioning away from um, eggs and dairy too, and I think that will be a hard transition, and it will probably take time. It might even take a decade. I don't know. Um, I find that to be much more difficult than giving up meat, but there is, it, it, there's absolutely nothing different in the argument. It's, it's everything I said is equally true for um, eggs and dairy, so, you know, I would like to be somebody who is who is consistent. I would like to, you know, act on the things I know. I'm a hypocrite now. I'm likely to be a hypocrite for quite a while, but I'm, you know, it's like a successive approximations. I try. I'm going to wake up tomorrow and have breakfast, and that's another opportunity, you know, to get it right. And I really think that's the way to think about it. That we're all going to wake up for breakfast tomorrow, and that's like, you know, n nonviolence begins at breakfast. Caring about the environment begins at breakfast. Um, caring about human health begins at breakfast. It, it will all, tomorrow is, is like another choice. All right, thanks. Do you have any idea what your next project is going to be? A novel. Just a novel. Just a novel, all right. Yeah. Uh, we'll see you in <laughs> a couple of years' time then. Yeah, yeah. yeah I hope so. All right, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Jonathan Seffron for things.